The fifth film in the Medea cinematic universe is I Can Do Bad All By Myself. Not exactly a great title for a movie, and especially not a Medea picture. This might be my autism speaking, but up until this point in Medea history, there has been a pattern with the movie titles. The chronologically even films have Medea's name in the title, and the chronologically odd films have other titles. And wouldn't you know, all the films that have Medea's name in the title performed better at the box office than their counterparts. After Medea Goes to Jail earned $90 million in February, Tyler Perry must have been hyped as fuck to rake in a similar amount of money with another Medea movie in September. But he gave the movie a dumb fucking name, so it only made $50 million. He would never make that mistake again. From this point forward, Every single MCU movie will have Medea's name in the title. So join me in evaluating the final Medea movie that dared to be different. I can do bad all by myself. Starting with some Medea hijinks. My main issue with Medea Goes to Jail was the character assassination of the titular character. Medea had been flanderized down to the embodiment of elderly black woman rage, and the endearing aspects of her character had been replaced with unjustifiable violence and destruction. My fear going forward was that Tyler Perry would continue this bastardized characterization of Medea into the remaining films, and that the Medea we grew to love was gone forever. Well folks, let me be the first to say, we're so back. Whatever affliction was causing Medea's rage has seemingly been cured between films. Medea is back and better than ever before. The pattern for Medea movies dictates that she isn't allowed to appear in the film until about 10 minutes in. But this movie breaks the mold with the earliest Medea sighting yet at around the two minute mark. However, I suspect this record-breaking early appearance is to distract the audience from the fact that halfway through the movie, Medea disappears and never shows up again. But we'll get to that later. Medea wakes up in the middle of the night to the sound of burglars in her home, and instead of calling the popo like so many white folk had done to her, she decides to take matters into her own hands. Must be somebody new to the neighborhood, they gonna break in my house? I'm my dear, and they gonna break in this house. <laughs> oh, hell no. But she's not confronting them alone. She needs her brother Joe as backup. Joe is introduced singing in his sleep, his melody a delightful parody of Beyonce's Single Ladies. Joe. Now roll the joint up. Oh, oh, oh. They go downstairs and find the burglars to be three black children stealing their VCR, which then gets dropped and destroyed by accident. Now, breaking into Medea's house is one thing, but breaking Joe's VCR is entirely different. So naturally, the geriatric duo beat the ever-loving fuck out of the children. Oh, what the hell? You made it drop my damn VCR oh. <laughs> 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 When I said we're so back, this is exactly what I meant. The punishment dished out by Medea actually matches the crime. She's not destroying somebody's car because of a stolen parking spot. She's whooping their little black asses for burglary and destruction of property. And in authentic Medea fashion, she prepares food for the children after beating them. This film understands the Medea character better in these three minutes than the last two movies combined. Medea is tough, but fair. She's a hard ass, but also kind. You're gonna get punished for doing wrong, but she'll then attempt to solve the root of the problem that made you act up in the first place. And Joe works as a great foil here. He doesn't understand Medea's act of kindness and spends the scene shit-talking the children. I don't know why the hell you feed these, Jerry. You know what? You feed them, you know what's gonna happen? They're gonna keep coming back, just like roaches. You got one roach in your house, you're gonna have thousands. I'm telling these kids, you ain't gonna never be able to get rid of these children. It's at this time, while sitting around the table with a group of children, that we are delivered the darkest joke in Medea history. And like any great joke, we're gonna need a long history lesson to truly appreciate the depths of its depravity. But before that, here's the joke. You ain't gonna never be able to get rid of these children. Just like you ain't been able to get rid of what you got. 
Scratch and sniff. <laughs> Shut your mouth. I was in an experiment with uh, in Tuskegee. This brief exchange might not seem like much, and honestly, you probably didn't even laugh. But given its proper context, these short lines of dialogue have depth and meaning in regards to both history and characterization that rivals even Shakespeare. And I'm not really even joking. For starters, the scratch and sniff joke Medea makes is about Joe having a sexually transmitted disease called syphilis. Joe responds dourly, claiming he was experimented on in Tuskegee. For those of you who don't know, in 1932, the United States government began conducting an experiment called the Tuskegee Syphilis Study. They wanted to observe the ongoing effects of syphilis on the human body over a lifetime. But evidently, it's hard to find hundreds of people to voluntarily suffer from untreated syphilis for 40 years. So, the government went into impoverished communities, and by that I mean black people, and tricked them into thinking they'd get free health care for their bad blood. In reality, the government was on the lookout for syphilis patients who didn't know they had it. And they found them. 399 to be exact. And although there were plenty of cures and treatments for syphilis as time went on, the scientists at the United States government intentionally kept these black men misinformed and withheld treatment for this debilitating illness for the sake of medical study. Now I know what you're sarcastically thinking. Wow, Jimmy. Joe was part of some evil racist study. That sure is the darkest joke I've ever heard. Well, just wait a goddamn minute. There are two points about this study that I need to make crystal clear. Number one, the government did not infect any of these men with syphilis. The men already had it from their own life of shenanigans. And number two, the study started in 1932, and the same group of men was followed for the next 40 years. They didn't have late entries to the study in 1950 or whatever. That's not how this shit works. Okay, with all of that information in mind, we can now fully appreciate this as being Tyler Perry's darkest joke yet. You see, the character of Joe was canonically born in the year 1925, which means Joe contracted syphilis before the age of seven. An optimistic person would hope that this young boy received this sexually transmitted infection in a harmless way. The only way to get syphilis is through direct contact with a syphilis sore, which can appear on a person's genitals, rectum, or mouth, so maybe his mom has mouth syphilis and he decided to kiss her. However, when Tyler Perry writes a dark joke, he packs in as much melanin as possible. Because as you may remember, the setup to this joke was Medea pointing down while saying scratch and sniff. And I don't think that exactly qualifies as the mouth region of a human. Which means American government scientists found a seven-year-old boy with lower body hemisphere syphilis, and instead of removing him from a home environment where he's clearly being sexually abused, they instead withheld medical treatment so they could study the infection's impact on his body for the next 40 years. While this serves as the darkest joke of this dramedy, it also provides a bit of character development for Joe. As you may recall during Medea's family reunion, Joe had a special interest in the rectal areas of his young family members. Could this perversion be the result of his childhood and the traumatic events that gave him an STI? Abuse like this is often a vicious cycle of child victims growing up and becoming abusers themselves. A year after this movie came out, and shortly following the death of his mother who inspired the Medea character, Tyler Perry did an interview with Oprah about his abusive childhood, and said he was molested by four different people before the age of 10. So for him as the Medea character, to make jokes at himself as the Joe character about getting sexually abused as a child makes this joke a shade so dark I can't even see it anymore. I knew that Medea movies were considered black comedy, but this is ridiculous. This brief dialogue exchange had the most depth and meaning of anything I've seen in the Medea film so far, so I'm gonna add a bonus point to Medea hijinks. 
Anyway, now that we've established that anyone with blind faith in the medical practices of the US government are history-denying retards, we can move on to more madcap Medea mischief. With no living parents and a missing caretaker, the orphan burglars have nowhere safe to stay. So Medea takes them to their aunt's house. Now I'll get into this aunt character later on in the video, but suffice to say she not only doesn't want the kids, but she hates them. And the exchange she has with Medea is pretty funny. What the hell y'all banging on my door for at this time of the morning? It's 7 a.m. I don't know who the hell you think you talking to, but it is 12.30 in the afternoon. I'm telling you, I don't have $300, and these ain't my kids. Lady, let me explain something to you. If you do not give me my money, I'm calling the popo on all three of these thugs. You can use my phone. After some bickering about the cost of Joe's broken VCR, Medea makes a deal with the kids that she won't press charges if they do work around her house. And then, she's kind of out of the movie. There are a couple short scenes of the kids coming over to clean, and Medea threatens to pimp slap them, but beyond that, there's not much else that I would consider hijinks. So to summarize the hijinks, we've got Joe singing a Smokey McPlant remix of Beyonce, Medea and Joe justifiably beating the shit out of children, the darkest joke in Medea history, and some humorous dialogue. There's a shocking lack of Medea content in this one, and as much as I love watching children get hurt, it was kind of a repeat of things we saw in Medea's family reunion. The hijinks might have been more authentic, but they were lacking in quantity. So for this one, I'm giving a 3, plus the bonus point, giving the film 4 hijinxical points. Not enough for me to change the spelling of hijinks back, but we're on the right track. The measure of Medea performance is simply an observation of how many different shades of Medea we're shown in any given picture. Where the previous film failed to showcase Medea as a three-dimensional character, this one is a near-picture-perfect portrayal of the character and everything she represents. And in my opinion, one of Medea's most important traits was the dishing out of life advice, which she offers here in spades. I'm banning anybody trying to give me advice. <laughs> oh, hell no. The eldest of the three orphan burglars is named Jennifer, and she has basically become the surrogate mother for her brothers. And the cruelty and evils of the world are no secret to this girl. She recognizes life for the hellhole it is, and knows that people aren't to be trusted. The orphan's mother was a crackhead who died from an overdose, and evidently, while she was alive, she traded Jennifer for crack at the age of nine, she put Byron in the oven by mistake, and she burned Manny with a crack pipe. But Medea has been around the block. She's from the sort of streets where your seven-year-old brother gets syphilis from his own dad and then experimented on by the government. She knows that bitterness towards the world isn't going to make these bad things go away. And she relays this, among other advice, to the young lady. You get out of this life what you put into it. If you give good things to people, good things will come back to you most of the time. That ain't true. I said most of the time, child. You know what happens when little girls act you that's mad at the world? They grow up and become bitter old women if they don't figure out what's going on with them. Bitter old woman, just like the one you sitting there talking to. A bitter old woman. A bitter 450 pound old woman. In Medea's final scene of the film, approximately halfway through, Jennifer is distraught after learning her caretaker grandmother had died, and she acts as Medea to teach her how to pray. This leads to a long, painful scene of Tyler Perry's infamously bad improv. He just starts rambling about Bible stories and pop culture references, and it's so bad I almost threw up. Peter was one of the 12 disciplines. And uh, they were on a boat out on the Isle of the Greek uh, Atlantic Ocean. Jonah passed by in the belly of the whale, and he looked down here at that whale, free willy, with Jonah inside the belly, and it made him distracted, so he started to sink. He tried to swim, he tried to swim, he just worried, and Jaws was coming, and all them Steve Spielberg had did that Jaws thing, and all that was around him, he was worried. That's right, Noah came rowing up in the arch of, of St. Louis Arch, and he got on there, and he said, ooh, thank you for saving me. Peter, Noah said, no problem, man, cool, what's up, fool? You know, so they spoke to each other. He said, come on, let me show you around, because Noah had turned the arch into a cruise ship. And you know who was on there? Uh -oh. Eve. Eve? She was in the VIP section. Oh, I'm sorry. Eve was put 
in the VIP section? If I recall, the whole point of the story was she was kicked out of the VIP section for being a parcel tongue fruit stealing bitch. Now, if I'm wrong and this isn't improv, and this was actually thought about and written down in a script and memorized and then performed by Tyler Perry, then that's almost worse and more embarrassing. So I sincerely hope this terribly unfunny scene was completely improvised. And at least it was slightly better than the Dr. Phil improv in the previous movie. So to summarize, we've got the full gamut of Medea here. She's angry and violent, She's caring and nurturing. She's funny enough to make the fat kid constantly laugh, and they left it in the movie for some reason, even though that character is canonically non-verbal autistic and doesn't have emotions in any other scene. And she's also unfunny enough to make me nearly vomit from bad improv. Overall, a huge improvement over the previous film, and I actually have hope for Medea in the future. So, in terms of Medea performance, I'm giving this one a 7 out of 10. While the film may have had a disappointing lack of Medea hijinks, it more than makes up for it with the new character, April. She's the aunt of the orphans and one of the most despicable human beings we've ever seen in these movies. The character arc of April starting off as a vile, selfish cunt who hates children and naturally progressing into a good person was the main hook of the story for me. And it's the main reason why I consider this to be a genuinely good movie despite the lack of Medea content. So if you'll allow it, I'd like to present some April hijinks. First and foremost, like all the best friends I've ever had, April is an alcoholic. And when her bartender friend cuts her off, she just steals the entire bottle of vodka and leaves. Her sex life consists of sleeping with a married man and teasing him about answering the phone when his wife calls. The man's name is Randy, and he's a piece of work himself. Despite being married and having kids, he also hates children. And April cites this as the main reason her orphaned family members can't stay with her. Y'all can't stay here, okay? I got a man and he don't like kids, so y'all gonna have to figure something else out. One of the orphans has asthma, and I really appreciated April's attitude about it. You can't smoke around him, he has asthma. Girl, this is my house, you can wait outside. Mm. You can't smoke around him, he's got asthma. You already said that. Meanwhile, the local church sends a Hispanic immigrant named Sandino to April's house to help fix it up. And Randy can't resist saying the most racist shit he can think of. And what the hell are you looking at, Mexico? Speaking of English, just you want me, Mexico? You want me to turn on some mariachi music, boy? As the film goes on, April feels torn between these two men. One represents the carefree life of debauchery and evil that she loves so much, and the other represents kindness, family, and genuine love. All of these positive things that she'd written out of her life had now forced their way in, and there's a dramatic climax where she has to ultimately choose which of these directions she wants her life to take. Naturally, this dramatic climax comes in the form of Randy... Uh... Well... I guess having both a wife and a mistress isn't enough for the guy, because he tries to... Uncle Joe, the orphan girl. I need to give him his insulin. Now see, what you need to do is take care of me. If you don't stop right now, I'm going to tell April. I think she's going to believe you. <laughs> Sandino, the Hispanic immigrant, did nothing the entire time Randy was being racist to him. He kept his cool and ignored it like anybody with an IQ over 80 tends to do. But when Randy starts physically harming a child, Sandino doesn't hold back. He attacks the dude and smashes him through a table. <laughs> It's actually pretty cool that Tyler Perry included a character that is smart enough to resist violence in the face of verbal racism, but instantly starts throwing blows when it's time to protect children. A message I assume a large portion of his fan base needs to hear. April walks in on this confrontation and must now choose who she wants to believe. Evidence doesn't really matter. 
It's clear to everyone what actually happened, but it's up to April to choose which path she wants to take. And it seems like she's choosing evil, because she tells Randy she believes him and sends him upstairs to get clean in the bath. But in reality, it's just a ruse. And she throws a stereo speaker in the tub to electrocute Randy to death! Don't you want me to put it down? I will, don't Take you! Take us out! It's fucking awesome! This is the second time a Medea movie has featured a woman torturing a man in a bathtub, and I've been equally delighted in both scenes. So yeah, April was a great character with a lot of fun hijinks and a well-crafted, believable character arc. And while I'm not going to give her a hijinksical score, I will be factoring all of this into the overall movie quality score. Oh yeah, I, I forgot to mention uh, this film is a musical, sort of. Basically, 20 full minutes of the 106 minute movie is just people performing full songs on a stage. The movie will realize we've gone 15 minutes without a break, so they'll just cut to the stage and someone will sing an entire song. Or we'll go to church and perform a six minute black choir anthem. Notice, you don't hear me complaining, do you? While not my usual style, this music was by no means bad. Just, uh, unnecessary? My theory is Tyler Perry realized his script was less than 90 minutes, so he tried to fill it up with Bible story improv. But that only added on 15 minutes, so he threw all the songs in to stretch out the runtime. If that's not it, then I don't know what the fuck they were thinking. Personally, I would cut them out, but I'm not upset that they were there. I genuinely really enjoyed this movie despite its lack of Medea content. And I've gotta say, the soundtrack and digital was by far the best of any movie I've ever seen. So shout out to, uh, Chris Faggot. In terms of overall movie quality, I'm giving this one a 9, giving it a final score of 20 out of 30 putting it in third place on our ongoing ranking. I think as a film, this might be the best of the Medea series so far, but as a Medea movie, it's obviously lacking the critical component. If you've watched this all the way to the end, just know I love you and would never withhold syphilis treatment from you. Now drop a like, write a comment, give me money on Patreon, and subscribe to my other channel. Bye, folks.